Good morning, church. Just gonna march on up here. Uh, I can't watch a, a camp video without getting camp songs literally stuck in my head. Whenever I see the videos of the campfire that we are all just watching, I just think mbop, 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 and all these other songs about frogs getting hit by cars. That's literally what that song is about, and I don't know why, but we sing in the camp every single year. So, anyway, uh, if you don't know my name, my name is Riley Pickrell. Uh, I get the honor of preaching this morning, and we're going to be continuing through the book of Luke on our sermon series uh, called Mission. And today Today we're going to be in Luke 12 and reading the, the parable of the rich fool. Uh, one of my favorite parables, actually. It's one that's very, uh, uh, what's the word about it? Uh, it just makes me think of just uh, kind of like the big questions of life. Like I love th kind of thinking of those big questions. But be turning over to Luke chapter 12, verse 13, uh, and I'll begin reading. Uh, before we go there, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to pray for the lesson. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this morning that we can come and worship you. And Father, I do pray as we approach your word this morning, uh, Lord, you can speak through it. I pray that each person in here leaves with exactly what you want them to hear. And that God, when we leave, that we can go into the week prepared and ready to go be your vessels. Uh, Lord, to be lights to the world and show them who you actually are and what you're like. God, I pray that you speak through me. May you speak loudly through your word. I ask all this in your son's name. Amen. And you guys get there, Luke 12, verse 13. And it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain man, or rich man, was uh, yielded in abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crop. Then he said, this is what I shall do, or this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. I like the message translation of that verse. It just says, fool, tonight you die. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing on, verse 20. Uh, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Verse 21. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. And... And let me just point out here, uh, has anyone ever been like in a class or a lesson and somebody asks something that's totally off topic? <laughs> Does not have anything to do with the lesson at all. That's kind of what happens here. Um, I remember when I was in high school, I went to a Catholic high school, so we had to take religious courses and things like that. And so I remember my junior year, we had to take a course called Morality, and it was a course of very high-minded ideas, and we'd read the writings of men that wrote really over a thousand years ago about the nature of morality, and it was all very confusing. And honestly, I never paid attention during that class. Um, but one day, my best friend uh, raised his hand in the middle of a lesson, and he was the kind of guy that never asked questions. Uh, and he had a question, and Mr. Schmeezen calls on him, and he says, uh, uh, Mr. Schmeezen, why does Jesus have a six-pack? Uh, and that was his question, and they'll say, yeah, every crucifix in our school, Jesus had a six-pack, uh, and the little statuette of him. Uh, so anyway, it was a very off-topic question, but that's what happens here. Uh, this guy kind of interjects from the crowd as Jesus, as you remember Kurt's lesson last week, whose opinion really matters as Jesus is kind of going over who God is and, and he is eternal and he has the ability to cast us, you know, and to give us our, our eternal destination. Yes, that's God. But also, he cares a lot about us. In fact, he made every person the exact way he intended to make them, with flaws and weaknesses. And really, the only opinion of anyone's who actually matters is God. And so, he, Jesus is going on, he's teaching these things about who God is, and then you get this guy that comes up and he says, teacher, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. 
completely off topic. And, and I love how Jesus addresses this guy because he doesn't really like shut him down and tell him, you know, hey, that's not you know, relevant. We'll get to that. Or, you know, go find someone else to do that. He actually masterfully sort of brings his question and, and kind of melts it into the rest of his teaching. Because last week's question was kind of whose opinion actually matters? Who, whose opinion actually is, has a, a real pull on our life? What, who should it be? And Jesus kind of addresses another topic. He goes, well, now what things actually matter? What things in life truly have value and importance that we should focus most of our energy on? And he says to this guy, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. Uh, and greed, possessiveness, and I think as Jesus is kind of telling here, it can come in all sorts of forms. It doesn't have to be, you know, with just money and wealth and material things. Possessiveness can also be of our energy, of our time. And Jesus is saying to guard yourself against these things, against greed. Uh, that word kind of guard, if you imagine, I don't know if anyone here, or maybe you have, I have never, have ever had to really guard something. Like, I can't think of something in my life I've ever had to guard. I remember growing up when I was a kid, like if my mom bought these little uh, drinkable yogurt things that Dannon makes, that me and my siblings would all just go crazy. Yes, <laughs> Danimals. They're amazing. And, but we would hide them in the fridge and make guard them to make sure nobody else got them because we're, there was a very specific number of them in the pack. Uh, but outside of that, I've never really had to guard something in my life. But you kind of think of places. Think of Buckingham Palace or the White House or, or maybe somewhere like uh, the National Archives that holds the, uh, the Constitution or something like that. These places are guarding things. And what does that mean about those things? That they're very important. The things that should draw sort of our attention to them. And, and Jesus says to guard yourself about or from greed, from possessiveness. And then he goes on in, in very Jesus fashion. He do, typically doesn't really just answer questions or answer requests. He tells a story. And he tells a story of a man who is, is rich. Which is not a bad thing. Being rich is not, having money, having wealth is not inherently bad in itself. Uh, and the man in the story, as you keep reading, he has a really good agricultural year. Like he has a great crop, uh, which is the highest form of success if you're from Ohio, having a great agricultural year. And, which is not bad. Having success, having money, and those things, those are all good. They're kind of neutral, uh, really. It's not really good or bad. And then the story starts to go downhill when the guy, you know, as you kind of read in the story, he starts to talk to himself a little bit. It starts to draw up plans. And he begins to draw up plans for the future of his wealth and, and what he's going to do. And you can kind of do a deep dive to what the crowd would have heard when he said that he was going to tear down his barns and then build newer ones. And, uh, people in the crowd this time would have kind of understood what the guy was doing. Um, he wasn't just looking for a place to store his crop because most farmers would have actually taken their crop pretty immediately and, and went to market and sold it at the harvest. So what most people would have kind of know, known is that he's building larger barns to hold his crop because if this was a good agricultural year, that means everybody's crops did good. So that, well, that would have meant that the price of the crop or whatever this grain was would have went down. So what this guy is doing is he's going to save his crop for a future date. He's going to go in the market when, after the, the market isn't as swelled as it is, he's going to then go in when the price is higher and sell his grain. And he can do this because he had money. Uh, most farmers wouldn't have had the space to store it. So if you were in this crowd, you can do a whole deep dive on that. It's very interesting. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, a wisdom. Most people, the move that he was making, would have looked at and said, yeah, that makes actually really good agricultural sense. Like, this guy was working pretty prudently. Uh, it was actually a very smart thing that he was doing. But there is one major miscalculation that Jesus eventually gets to that this guy made. And that miscalculation was that his plan with what he'll do for his wealth, it, it did not have God as a part of it. God was not in his plan. It wasn't that he had a plan for the future. It was bad. It's actually a very good thing. But it was that plan didn't include God and what he cares about. The man was living for this world. This side of eternity is what his focus was on. Uh, and we kind of see, as the man uses his time and energy and focus to kind of figure out, what am I going to do with all this beautiful grain? There is no part of it that included how he could be actually rich toward God or give back to God. And a man's life in the story, as we kind of see, it comes to an abrupt end. Fool, tonight you die. And it ended suddenly. And God gets kind of the last word in the story. And the last word that God gets is, 
then who's going to get what you have prepared for yourself? And kind of changing gears here, and I think this is a very interesting thing, and uh, there is a certain word that no human being from the dawn of creation till now has ever truly been able to use, and that word is the word mine. We can never, in the truest sense, actually use that word mine. Because everything in our lives, the things that we have, our time, energy, paycheck, our bodies, the, our relationships, all those things are not inherently earned by us. We don't actually get them. If you really think about it, the clothes that you're wearing, that you purchased with the money that you earned, you earned it using the legs and the mind and the hands and all the other things that God gave you. If you trace everything back, everything will inevitably go back to God. That there's truly nothing we can say is ours. There's this really interesting book. It's called The Screwtape Letters. It's by a guy named, yes, uh, it's by a guy named C.S. Lewis. If you ever get the chance to read it, highly recommend it. It's a phenomenal book. But the, the kind of the whole main point of the book, or what's happening in it, it's a, it's a collection of correspondence letters between two demons. Um, and one of them is an older one, an older de demon, his name's Screwtape. And the younger one is named uh, Wormwood. Uh, and basically, Screwtape is this older, seasoned tempter. He's very good at, at tempting and doing his job. Uh, and, and Wormwood is kind of like a young protege demon. Like, he's kind of learning how to be a demon. Uh, and so Screwtape is guiding him about how to tempt and how to mislead people away from God in the most efficient manner. And these guys are, are good at their job. They know what to do. The, the whole book, it's very dark, but it's also extremely thought-provoking. Uh, it's one of those books that you can read, a, you know, two pages and just chew on it for days. Very good. I highly recommend it. But in one of the parts of the book, one of these letters, the, the older demon discusses with the younger one one of the kind of silliest assumptions that all humans make, and is that thinking that there are things on this earth that are truly ours that we have earned them, that they belong to us. And his advice to his young protege about this, because he kind of, he's very open to the young demon. He says, yeah, this idea that humans actually own things, their time, their money, their bodies, this possessiveness, if they figure it out, there is no argument that we could give to them. It's so clear and simple. If they actually just see what's the, what the truth is, we can't unturn that. So his advice to him, and it's a quote from the book, is to wrap a darkness around it. In the center of that darkness, let ownership and time lie silent, uninspective, or uninspected and operative. That that's the one thing that when we don't notice, when we don't truly really see that we don't actually own things this side of eternity, that they can't really undo that once that comes up. So the best thing to do is to make people not pay attention to it to still imagine that they, they can actually own things. And, and I love this. I think it's uh, uh, because when we truly have God's perspective that there, you know, that everything that we're given is, you know, from the breath in the morning, from uh, the food that we eat, all these things, if they, we see them as a pure gift from God, it changes the way we live. We do not approach these things the same way. And the way we treat people, the gratefulness that we have for them things, it completely changes. And we start not living for this world, but living for a world beyond this one. We live totally different. And, you know, I don't ever get to see, we don't ever get to see how the brothers in the story respond. Like, I would like to imagine that after hearing the story about the man that suddenly dies and loses everything he has, I like to imagine that these two brothers, like, one of them's like, ah, you know what? this isn't right of me. I shouldn't be demanding this inheritance from you. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I'm just, I just want, I'll work for you. I'll, I'll be a part and I'll, I'll give my effort and all that kind of stuff. But the inheritance is yours. That's true. I got like to imagine that. And maybe the older one would have been like, you know what? No, we're going to do this together. 50-50. We're splitting this thing. We're going to be, we're going to work uh, our fathers, what he's given us. And, and we're going to cut it down the middle and we're going to work as a team. I like to imagine that's what happened, but Luke never writes it. Like, we don't actually get to hear. Uh, and Luke isn't writing this as a historical account, because the question really is for us, what are we going to do with our lives, with the things that are given to us, our time, our energy, our money, relationships, connections, our bodies? What will we choose to live for? Will we live for this world, this side of eternity, or will we choose to, to build up God's kingdom? to live for the next life, and a life totally different. 
thinking about this, uh, I, 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 mean, I like to kind of think about this, uh, living for this world or the next, is it's kind of like the difference between a, a spacecraft and, and an airplane. Um, I don't know if you guys ever grew up, I love space. I remember when I was a young kid, I, one of the very first moments where I really started to contemplate God and who he is, I remember I was eight years old. You know, it was the church I grew up in. We had this guy come in and give kind of a talk about the wonders of the universe. And I think that was the first time in my life when he started talking about suns and how there are stars outside of our solar system, other kind of suns, that are just ridiculously massive. That one of the largest stars in our solar system, or not our solar system, uh, in our galaxy, it's called uh, 218 Stevenson. It's a, it's a star that was discovered a few years ago. But anyway, its size compared to Earth is the size of a minivan compared, compared to the state of Texas. Ridiculous. And, and these things are out there. And I remember being there, and it was the first time in my life I was like in awe of God. I was like, wow, these things are here. God made this. Yeah, I think of the words of David. And how is God still mindful of us? who made the stars and made the cosmos. And so I love the stars. But in this illustration, living for this world or the next, it's kind of like an airplane and a spacecraft. The airplane is the living for this side of eternity sort of part of it. And in an airplane, you can fly around the world. You can see amazing things. If you've ever flown the airplane, looked out, you can see some pretty gorgeous views. You see the clouds kind of laid out like a blanket. You see the sun. Sometimes if you catch a sunrise, you can see the sun rising up through it. You can see beautiful things. But airplanes also work against gravity. They have to, to really work against it, and there's a lot of fuel involved. And in an airplane, no matter where you are or what kind of airplane, eventually that plane is going to run out of gas. It's going to stop, and its flight will be over. Now, on the flip side, if you think about space travel, um, I don't know how many people are into space travel or that kind of stuff, uh, but a rocket getting into space, there is a lot of extra effort from the jump. You've got to train differently. Um, I can never go to space. I would throw up everywhere. I have horrible <laughs> motion sickness. There's a different uh, type of training. There's a lot of effort that goes into making sure the men that go up into space are prepared for it. Uh, the spacecraft is built differently. It takes a, a ton of fuel because you're basically shooting a missile into the space in, in space. You have to get it through the atmosphere. But once you get past the atmosphere, once all the initial process from the beginning is, is really done and set, it just takes off. The initial velocity of uh, whatever that rocket, when it gets to space, however fast it's going, it will continue theoretically like that forever. It will never stop, unless it hits a planet or something like that. But theoretically, it will never stop because there's no gravity in space. It just kind of goes. That's how we can send like the Hubble telescope and vessels like that so far into space. And that's the kind of difference between this life, living for this life and the next. Like an airplane, that's going to run out of fuel one day. It's a beautiful ride. It's awesome. Airplanes are cool, but it will end one day. But with a spacecraft, from the jump, if the effort's put there, if, if all the effort's there and, uh, and you invest the time and you've got your sights focused on what's beyond, you get space and it never ends. And that's kind of like what it is living for this life or the next. When, when we live and do things for this world, those things eventually will end. The what, whatever you own today, whether it's money or a house or anything like that, all of that 100 years ago belonged to someone else. And 100 years from now, it will belong to someone different. Or it wasn't created 100 years ago, but 100 years from now, it's probably going to be gone, unless it's made of styrofoam. Styrofoam lasts forever. <laughs> if you want to pass on your styrofoam cooler to your grandchild, that will probably go on for a long time. But it will, too, also come to an end. But when we invest in things in this life, when we do things, and there are things that we can do in this life that have eternal impact, that we can do them, and the effects and the ripples that they have will never end. This is what being rich toward God is. The effects of sitting down with a friend to look at the scriptures. Uh, or maybe even just asking somebody, what do they think about God? There is eternal effects when we do that. I love it when Kurt talks the idea about the switch in someone's mindset from the, when they go from pre-contemplation pre to contemplation. It's a psychological idea, but essentially just means when somebody goes from a mindset of, you know, my actions don't affect me or other people. Like, there's no actual real consequence. I don't see anything wrong with these actions. To going to then from a mindset of, oh wait, Actually, maybe this isn't so good for me. 
oh, maybe this does affect somebody else. When you make that jump in your mindset, it is the single greatest jump to make in somebody's sort of process and what they're dealing with or anything like that. When we sit down and, and look at the Bible, or even just ask someone what they think about God and share from our own experience and what, what we've learned, what we've done, we can help someone, or God can do through that one interaction something that will last forever. God can affect that. I think of other things, taking time to serve somebody. Or acts of service. Uh, these acts of service, they can really change not only the person that's being served, but also the person serving. Like, they kind of do double duty. I think of our camp counseling. I've been going there for about three years. Uh, Danielle also started the same year I did, and we've been doing, uh, we counseled our camp. And you can ask either of us that, uh, you know, the transformative, uh, you know, process that happens on you when you're at our camp, it's kind of like putting like a hot or a piece of metal into like a crucible. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's very difficult. You can get to points of the week where children are just not having it. Like, they're not going to listen. And you have to say for the millionth time, can you please pick up your plates after lunch? Could you please do that? But this process, you leave our camp truly feeling like you can love better. It transforms hearts. And even for the kids, looking back and seeing times uh, when they were treated with, with love and with respect and, and hearing about a God that truly values them, not for what they do, but just for who they are, these moments, transformative. That's storing up riches in heaven. Money that's saved and, and kind of uh, given to support ministry, whether here or anywhere else through special missions, that money has eternal impact when we choose to. I think another interesting thing about money when it comes to this discussion is that you don't have to have a lot of money to be obsessed about money. Take it from me. I've never had a lot of money in my life. Moving out here, I've always kind of been like on the fringe and I've had to learn a lot about being wise with money. Uh, but I've probably spent just as much time focused on money and catching up and you know trying to make ends meet and all that kind of stuff. I've probably spent just as much amount of time focusing on that on someone who maybe has a lot and is trying to manage it all. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of money to still be obsessed with it. It's all the same. I love, there's a proverb that goes that prudence is a fountain of life to the prudent. That those who use it well, well or wisely in this life, it's life overflowing um, when your focus is not on those things. And these kind of actions, these living for the other side of eternity, these actions ring on forever. And typically, when somebody is changed or affected by what you do, it's like a ripple effect. It doesn't just end with that person, because then they're going to go off, they're going to live for another world, and they're going to change many more people. That one action's effects, it's a ripple. So where will you choose to invest the gifts given to you? God's ends or yours? I think that there is, there is a trick of time that we all kind of... Time is like a funny thing, I feel like, on Earth. Like... Uh, we all drive in our cars all the time. Like, we probably drove over here. Like, we operated a two-ton piece of metal at 70 miles per hour down the road, but many of us probably don't remember doing it. Uh, but we, like, literally just did it. Uh, that's, like, that's a trick of time. Time does that the more we do things. And I think one of the tr biggest tricks of time is that we always think we have more. You always think there's going to be time to do something. The I, I will do it phenomenon, it applies to dishes and to our souls. We will always feel like we have more time to do things. And this is, in, even as C.S. Lewis will talk about in his book, this is the trick that the, that the demon, the advocates, uh, or the ones against us, not the advocates, uh, this is what they want us to believe, that we really do have more time to do these things. When the truth is, we never really know. So based off where you spend your time and energy and money, what would be the most valuable thing in your life? Uh, kind of bringing in the sermon for a close today, I want to end with a psalm. Uh, this is a psalm that was written literally like uh, 2,500 years ago, or no, more like 3,000 years ago by David. Uh, the psalm is Psalm 39, verse 3. And it goes, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth, and the span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely, everyone goes around like a mere phantom, in vain rushing about, heaping up wealth, and not knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Living a rich life toward God 
It's not about giving a tithe or showing up to church or church events throughout the week, but being rich toward God is about truly living a lifestyle that's otherworldly, completely different, because the world that we're living for is not this one, but it's going to be the next one. So with that, guys, that's all I got for you this morning. Um, I do have a few.